All right. So another thing you can do is you can modify a system binary so that when the operating system thinks it's loading a normal service, it's going to run your function instead. Dills are the easiest to attack because there's an entry function, dill main, and you can just put malware there or put a jump to malware there. Uh, that's a simple thing. Then you insert the code in some empty portion of the binary. It, so it jumps, runs your code, and then returns and runs the dill normally. So it continues to work, and you don't break the machine, which is nice. Um, I'll, almost all files do have these things I've called, seen called code caves. There are blocks of like thousands of bytes not used in many executables. They're there in case you have to add more code later with revisions and stuff. Um, so there's plenty of room in most executables to put reasonable malware. Um, so here's uh, the original code at dill entry point. It moves EDI to EDI and pushes e, EVP and stuff like that. And after this, your dill entry point is changed to just a jump. So now it's going to jump to this other location where it's going to do malicious stuff and then do this stuff. So the dill will still work. It'll be a little bit slower, but nothing will probably ever notice. And it will have the malware running. Then the most common technique, I think, of all, well, this isn't the most common technique, but that's, that's coming next time. But this is one, is dill load order hijacking. Uh, this has been around forever. It's also called a companion Trojan. Um, back when Windows NT was brand new, Windows NT, you would log in, and then it would launch explorer.exe, which drew the desktop and the start button. And the registry key just said launch explorer.exe. It did not say launch C Windows System 32, explorer.exe. So all you had to do was to put any function you want, name it explorer.exe, and put it earlier in the path, like in the root of C. And it would be found first, and it would run that instead of the actual desktop drawing program. And that was um, because Microsoft did not specify the complete path to executables, and that's been their recommendation since then, is whenever you are launching anything programmatically, you should give the full path, system root, Windows, system 32. Uh, then you, this won't happen to you. But it, DILs, very often, do not specify the full path. Although in those registry shots you saw earlier, they were specifying the full path. <coughs> but if you don't specify the full path for a DIL, then Windows will hunt for it. Looking in the directory the application was loaded from, like if you're loading it from a USB stick, it'll look on the USB stick to see if there's a dill there with that name. Then the current directory, the working directory with the process that's looking for it. Then the system directory, the 16-bit system directory, the Windows directory, anything else in the path. Every piece of installed software typically adds more stuff to the path. So you could put a dill with the same name any of these places, and it will accidentally load the wrong dill. This is how Stuxnet worked to destroy the nuclear isotope separators in Iran. The USB stick had a program and it had a dill right on the stick, which it would load in the memory instead of getting the right dill from system. It's a cute tick and it works very well. Anyway, that's a, they call it dill load order hijacking, where you trick it into loading malicious dill by putting it in an earlier place in the search path. Uh, then there's a thing called known dills. Now this is an attempt to prevent this attack. The known dills registry key specifies exactly where system dills should be loaded from. So it does not go through the search, it just goes to the right place. And that's fine, and that means you cannot perform the dill load order hijacking on these dills anymore, but you can still do it on binaries that don't load from system 32. Um, and uh, if your binaries are in other directories or if they're not protected by known dills. Not everything is protected by known dills. So explorer.exe lives in Windows, and then it loads this thing from system 32. It's not a known dill, so a default search is performed. So you can put a malicious NT shrewy some ways, and it will load. Um, like everything else in Windows, they have a defense, and when you look at it, they only apply to defense about half the time. The other, there's a bunch of pieces of Windows that are not actually using the latest defenses, and that's typically how you get in. They lower the attack surface from being every dill down to just a few dills they didn't protect, but they never seem to be able to get it all the way to zero in any of these defenses. Uh, so there's plenty of vulnerable dills. Startup binaries not found in System32 is vulnerable. Explorer.exe has 50 vulnerable dills. Known, uh, known dills are not fully protected because dills can load other dills, and then they aren't known, and the recursive imports follow the search order. So, you know, it sounds good, but in actual practice, it's kind of a screen door, only stopping about half the attacks. 
Uh, there's a detector for this from SANS from 2015. You can load something and it will then hunt for DILs that appear multiple times in the file system and in suspicious folders or unsigned. So it will scan your system and see if someone has been doing this to you, which is a pretty good idea. There should be only one copy of each DIL in the right place. Um, and then privilege escalation is a huge issue. If you're a limited user, you want to be administrator. If you're administrator, you want to be system. You know if you do uh, Metasploit, it has all these attacks to try to elevate the system. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. But to have good fun like steal the password hashes, you've got to elevate the system. So uh, now if you run an XP, then it's really easy, of course, <coughs> because there was no user account control. So everybody ran as administrator all the time. And you could easily escalate the system by just uh, injecting a deal in the process. Um, and that worked fine. But now we have user account control. Um, if you want to get above the, pr the privileges of the administrator, um, there are processes like terminate process and create remote thread that require system privileges. And the SE debug privilege gives you that. So you can elevate to debugging, which gives you the right to do those things. Um, and here's how malware enables SE debug privilege. Just like, remember, if you did that uh, in exploit development class, we did a ROP defeating DEP. So we, if you have data execution prevention and it's stopping your malware from running, you just make a ROP chain of commands that turn it off. This is the crazy thing about Microsoft defenses. You, there is an API call to turn off the defense. And all you have to do is find a way to call it. So here's the malware turning off this elevating you, uh, you just a token adjust privileges is the parameter. And then you call this as look up privilege value and, and send it the SED bug privilege, open process token, and then look up privilege value. You just change the privilege value to change yourself to system. And now you've got system privileges. There has to be some way to do it. And you just have to make the right API call to do it. Um, and so first, this reads the privileges, and this is what adjusts token privileges. So, you know, that's life. Now, this is why Microsoft's defense was to try to pop up a box and require the user to click yes every time this happened. And that drove everybody nuts on Vista. And on Windows 7, it happens less often. But that's one way, is user account control, to try to make sure that the user knows this kind of high dangerous stuff is happening. Anyway, then there's user mode rootkits. Um, so rootkits in general want to hide things in the operating system. So processes are running, network connections are made, files are stored, and all of them are invisible. So your antivirus can't see them, and you can't see them in your directory listing. That's the goal. So your machine can be being used for something evil, and you don't know that's happening. Um, kernel mode rootkits are, of course, more powerful, but there are user mode rootkits. They're less powerful, but they're more common because they're easier to write and install. Um, one way to do it is import address table hooking. Now remember, you got import address tables and export address tables. These are in the PE file header, and these control of the exports are what services it's offering to other software, which is uh, typically for an executable, you only offer one entry point, main, and that's it. For a DIL, you offer a bunch of functions. And the imports are the functions you use elsewhere. So these are filled in by the loader when you load your process to run it. And you can modify them so that you change the import. So when your program tries to make a library call, it calls malware instead. That's a simple way to do it. So here's import address table hooking. So here's a legitimate program here. And it decides to call some kind of API call, like terminate process. So it goes to the import address table and says, OK, where, how do I get to terminate process? And this import address table tells it, that's in kernel 32. Go over here and get there. But if you have a hook, it just changes that entry. So terminate process, instead of pointing to the real kernel code, points to 342. Then you go to 342 and do malicious things, and then go up there and do it. So now it'll terminate process, except if that's a process I don't want you to terminate, in which case it won't terminate it, and so on. You change, you hook the uh, thing that looks for files and say, it'll let you see the file, unless it's one of the files I'm hiding, in which case I won't let you see it. And that's the game, a very simple technique. And not very subtle. If you look at the, inter in, at the import address table, you can quickly see that one of those values is wrong. <coughs> All right. So that's one technique, a very simple technique. Then there's inline hooking, where you actually overwrite the API function code in the DIL. So up in this picture, instead of just changing the import address table, you change that code, that push and 
call kernel and all that jazz. You go and rewrite the code to do something different. Now, you've got to be pretty careful, or you're going to break the dills, and they won't work anymore. It's more advanced, but it is more subtle, much harder to spot. There is not an obviously wrong number in a list of pointers like there is. There's just a bunch of assembly code, and there's a different bunch of assembly code, and unless you can really read that assembler and you know what it should look like, it's going to be hard for you to tell that there's been a malicious alteration there. And that's, of course, the game. The smarter attackers can make their attack more and more sneaky and hard to detect. <clears throat> All right. So which one of these adds malware to an empty portion of a Windows component? All right, and that is your Trojanized system binaries. Good. Glad to see that. Popular answer. And which one is a registry key that prevents load order hijacking? And that's known dills. For these dills, don't just go hunting all over the place. I'll tell you where it needs to be. And don't accept any other place, which is a pretty good idea. Which one has 50 vulnerable dills, even after known dills protection, which is, at first, I was disgusted when I saw this, and I've gotten used to it. Microsoft trumpets a new defense, and when you look at it, only half of it works. That's the way it always is. I'll quit at 30. All right, and that's explorer.exe, the most common, or one of the most common targets because it's going all the time. Anyway, all right. They never don't bother to change it, right? <laughs> they change it, but they just seem to add more vulnerable things to it. Just it's keep it the same name. They never changed the name. They've never changed it since Windows NT. Yeah. All right. So uh, which one is a hacking tool that makes privilege escalation easy? I'll quit at 30. <clears throat> Hope you guys know your Metasploit. Metasploit is for that. <laughs> Metasploit Meta is, is the hacking tool. The rest of these things are, are well, these are actually Windows features, and this is not really what you call a tool. That's a category of malware. Anyway, um, all right, let's see if we got one. Which one changes function code, not pointers? Here I think there's one right answer, and only one. Some of these questions are better than others. For the quizzes you take online, I got a student to help write them, and I think they come out a lot better now. The two of us work together on them, instead of it just being restricted to my imagination. Anyway, um, all right, that's inline hooking, where you actually alter the assembly code. Um, for advanced attackers only. So I'll stop the recording and see who won. This is 126, chapter 11b.